I want to ask you guys a question. What makes a good horror game? <laughs> In my opinion, it's the ability to immerse you into the environment and story to the point that it makes you feel incredibly uneasy. Oh my fuck! Making you question everything that's going on around you and what's waiting for you up ahead. Ah! A good horror game must leave a lasting impression on you, to the point that by the end you feel like a complete vegetable. Think of games like Silent Hill 2, Dead Space, Condemned Criminal Origins, Outlast, or indie titles such as Cry of Fear or Iron Lung as prime examples of what makes an ideal horror game. Instead of relying on a constant barrage of jump scares in order to evoke terror from the player, they use alternative methods like sound, lighting, enemies and the environment in order to force you into a constant state of dread. Basically, if a horror game manages to deliver an incredibly disturbing experience that will leave you thinking about it for days after you finished it, then it's mission accomplished. And I don't think there's been a better example of a game that's accomplished that in the most unique way possible than Doki 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 Literature Club. Okay, there's no way. <laughs> now, I know what you may be saying. Asparagus, this looks like a dating simulator for people who watch Crunchyroll 24-7. And yes, you would be right, it does look like that. But dig slightly more beneath the surface, and you'll find that Doki Doki Literature Club is one of the most disturbing and horrifying video games you will ever experience. When you put up the game for the first time, you are given a warning stating that this game is not suitable for children and people who are easily disturbed, and individuals suffering from anxiety or depression will not have a safe gaming experience. You also have to agree that you are over 13 and ready to be exposed to disturbing content. So already, the game sounds pretty dark for something that looks so cutesy on the Steam store page, which is made even more confusing when you get to the main menu. The upbeat music, the bright feminine colors, and the anime characters who are without a doubt all below the age of 18 completely contrast with the warnings at the beginning. Nevertheless, you press new game, enter your name, and start playing. When the game begins, you find yourself looking at a drawn background with a text box at the bottom. The gameplay is very simple for a visual novel. You simply click on a box, read what the characters have to say, and then you proceed to the next scene. Occasionally, you will have to make choices, and there is also a recurring minigame in which you write poems, but apart from that, the game is so simple that even a fetus would be able to play it. You're playing as an average male high school student with interest in anime. So basically, you are a massive loser. You are then introduced to the protagonist's best friend, a bubbly and charismatic girl called Sayuri. She comes across as a bit of an airhead, with the introducing monologue explaining how she usually wakes up late. When she asks you if you decided to join any school clubs yet, you respond with, no XD, which causes great concern for her, because who the fuck in 2023 still uses XD unironically? Me, that's who. I put this fucking line in my script for some reason. I don't know why, don't ask, I just did it. I was talking about how I'm worried that you won't learn how to socialize or have any skills before college. And I know you're happy now, but i die at the thought of you becoming a neat in a few years because you're not used to the real world. You eventually agree to look at some clubs, prompting a joyous response from Sayuri. What's really noticeable about the beginning is how it doesn't fit with our traditional perceptions of horror video games, despite being listed as one on Steam. Usually, you can easily identify a horror game from the start through music or color palette, or just by recognizing that you will soon be put into a situation that will force you to fight your way out of it. In Doki Doki however, there is no such indication. The color palette is the literal definition of the word saturation, the music is incredibly upbeat, and the story of you joining a club at the request of your carefree best friend doesn't scream anything suspicious or indicative of something terrible happening. Later, you meet up with Sayuri again, and she convinces you to join her at a literature club of whom she is the vice president, having told the rest of the members that a new member would be joining. Subsequently, you are introduced to other members of the club, Yuri, Natsuki, and Monica, the club president 
president. You know, something tells me that neither of these girls are over 18. I don't know, maybe it's the fact that we are all in high school. So lines like these, they are just not right. Like, I'm probably on a government watch list already just for making this video. What's interesting about the characters is that every single one of them fits into a particular trope, which is so exaggerated that it becomes comical. Yuri is incredibly shy and has difficulty communicating with other people unless it's about literature. So in other words, she's autistic. Natsuki embodies the classic Tsunodri stereotype of a harsh and assertive girl who eventually warms up to the player. Sayori is innocent and nice to everybody, and Monica is smart and popular. Dan Salvato, the man who made Doki Doki Literature Club, said in the concept art booklet for the game that the goal for the characters was to give nods to games that are genuinely badly written, while at the same time establishing a sense of authenticity that will make the game and its characters enjoyable. As we will see later, these tropes are merely a facade for more complex and humane individuals. We interact with the characters and get a basic sense of who they are, who we like and don't like, and towards the end we agree to become an official club member, mainly due to the fact that our protagonist is a horny twat. We are then given a task, to write a poem and bring it in for the next club meeting. The way this is done is actually pretty cool. It's basically a mini game in which we select a bunch of words on a page, and if the word is compatible with the girl's taste, their avatar in the bottom left hand corner will jump. When we go back to the club the next day, our poem will have a massive effect on our interactions with other characters. If you wrote a poem by selecting words that were compatible with Natsuki for example, you will interact with her at the beginning and get a bigger sense of her character. The same also goes for Yuri and Sayori, allowing you to progress your relationship with either of these girls and understand them a bit better. For example, Yuri will read a book with you and you will get a sense that she may be attracted to you, Natsuki will read her favorite manga with you and if you choose Sayori, you will button her blazer. Now that's proper exciting shit right there. But hold on, Asparagus. This is classified as a psychological horror game on Steam. And yet the only horror that I see are four high school girls because I'm a massive incel. It's called setting up, you lobotomite. Can you fucking wait a little bit? The poem that you write will also affect how the characters respond when you show it to them. If you wrote a poem for Yuri, for example, she will praise your work. And if you show that same poem to Natsuki, she will just straight up tell you it's shit and recommend that you start over. Wow, what a helpful fucking person you are. These conversations also provide insight into what kind of writing each of the girls prefer. Yuri prefers vocabulary that is formal, Sayori likes to use pretty standard words and also words that convey emotion, and Natsuki likes cute words and just basic nouns. Using this knowledge, you can now write your poems more confidently for any girl you want. You can also write poems for just one character, and you will start to discover that they are more complex than just a bunch of stereotypical anime girls. Sayori, for example, goes from someone you perceive as this constantly bubbly airhead to someone incredibly solemn and thoughtful of others. On day three, when it becomes apparent that she's not feeling well, she brushes off your concerns and tells you how happy she is to see you interacting with others. If you wrote a poem for her and then present it to her, she becomes very emotional. The happy music that accompanied the poem readings briefly goes on mute and is then replaced by a melancholic piano melody. Something's clearly not right. You don't want to get closer with everyone else? Of course I do! But that doesn't mean I need to try so hard to impress them. I I still understand you the most, Sayori. I know you have to sometimes put up with me, and I have to sometimes put up with you, but we have a wavelength or something. And this is how the poem came out. Sometimes it feels like you're the only exciting thing in my life. So sometimes it's just easier to write when thinking about you. N no I don't deserve this. You're too nice to me. Why are you doing this? Sayori has trouble keeping her voice steady all of a sudden. If you had fun with everyone else instead, this would be so much easier. Sayori! I glance around the room to make sure nobody has noticed this. I've probably never said this before, but I don't understand what you're feeling right now. Tell me what will cheer you up. Sayori shakes her head. She sniffles and keeps shaking her head. Finally, she gathers herself and puts on a smile. It's just a little rain cloud. I'm sorry you had to see that. I promise it won't happen again. It's pretty concerning to see her mood shift from constantly happy to melancholic, but we have no reason to think anything bad will happen, so we proceed forward. Natsuki, abiding by the Tsunodri trope, transitions from a constantly hostile dickhead to someone trying to hide her insecurities through arrogance. She starts to come across as someone who sees the literature club as the only place where she can feel comfort, which makes her more relatable and multi-layered as a character. Yuri, meanwhile, goes from being simply shy to being the literal embodiment of 
social anxiety, feeling that books are the only way she can escape other people judging her. This complexity is even embedded in the poems the girls write. Sayori's poem Bottles, for example, is her expressing how she sacrifices her own happiness so that she can give it to others. Yuri's two-part poem Ghost Under the Light is about her isolation and desire for someone to reach out to her, while Natsuki's poem Because of You is literally thanking the protagonist for spending time with her. What many of you might have noticed by this point is that Monica is the only character for whom you don't write a poem. Despite her status as club president, here she's merely a supporting character whose existence is only encouraging the player and giving him some advice about poetry. Here's Monica's writing tip of the day. Sometimes you'll find yourself facing a difficult decision. When that happens, don't forget to save your game. Wait, what? You never know when you might change your mind. Or when something unexpected may happen. Yeah, that's totally not concerning at all. I know what you are! After showing your poem to Sayori, she leaves the club early, telling the protagonist she isn't feeling too well. Following the end of poem reading, discussions are made about the upcoming school festival, where the club will attempt to attract new members. You are given the choice of working with either Natsuki or Yuri. You also have the Monica and Sayori options, but they are not viable. After choosing who you want to spend your weekend with to prepare for the festival, you exchange phone numbers, agree to meet on Sunday, and depart back home, contend that you will no longer have to deal with being a massive virgin. When Sunday arrives, the protagonist decides to go check up on Sayori, concerned for her well-being after she left the club early last time. As you reach her house, the music abruptly fades away, creating an eerie sense of concern, and the screen turns to black as you enter her house. This puts you into a state of worry. Why is the screen gone black? Why is the music gone? And most importantly of all, is Sayori okay? You eventually find Sayori in her bedroom, thankfully alive, and the silence gives way to another melancholy piano melody. Sayori's behavior is radically different. Clearly, something happened to her, so being the good friend that we are, we decide to ask her about it. I just wanted to see how you were doing. When something's wrong, you can't hide it from me. I know you too well. Sayori smiles, shaking her head. That's no good. Why can't it be just like it's always been? This is all my fault. If I didn't get so weak and accidentally express my feelings, if I I didn't make that stupid mistake, then you wouldn't have been worried about me at all. You wouldn't have come here. You wouldn't have even been thinking about me right now. But this is just my punishment, isn't it? I'm getting punished for being so selfish. I think that's why the world decided to have you come over today. It just wants to torture me. Sayori! I grab Sayori by the shoulders. What on earth are you saying? Are you listening to yourself right now? I know something happened to you. There's no other explanation for you to be like this. So tell me already. Although she's initially hesitant to reveal what's wrong, Sayori eventually confesses to us that she has been suffering from depression her whole life. This explains not just her constant oversleeping, but also why she's been wanting you to get along with other girls. She doesn't want anyone to care about her. She sees herself as worthless and prefers to make others happy, something that's reflected in her bottles poem, literally hurting herself in order to give happiness to her friends. She believes that she's being rightfully punished for her wrongdoings and doesn't want you to feel sympathy for her. This revelation is shocking to say the least, and being the decent human beings that we are, we comfort her and assure her that everything is going to be okay. Much like our previous interactions with Yuri and Atsuki, this scene serves to expose to Yuri's more multi-layered character that is more than just the embodiment of a trope. At this point, you don't just feel invested into the story, you actually start to care about and feel empathy for the characters. After comforting Sayori, we contemplate cancelling our meeting with whatever girl we've chosen, but Sayori tells us not to, and even though we invite her to participate in festival preparations, she solemnly refuses, and we subsequently leave her house, pondering over everything we've just witnessed. Arriving back at our house, we are greeted by either Natsuki or Yuri, and upon inviting them inside, we get to the festival preparations. You will either be making decorations with Yuri, or baking cupcakes with Natsuki, and either way you will grow closer to the girls, getting hints at their own troubles. For example, when you come back with a tray full of glasses with water, Yuri noticeably rolls up her sleeves, an action which has dark implications. It's possible that Yuri doesn't just have social anxiety, but may also be engaging in self-harm, which may explain her raccoon poem, in which the titular rodent represents her self-mutilation urges, and her constantly feeding this raccoon bread is a literal metaphor for her becoming increasingly addicted to feeding this self-harming urge. This is made further evident when Yuri tells the protagonist that she has an interest in knives, which given the poem that she gave you, just screams self-harm. After finishing your collaborative project, you escort Yuri slash Natsuki out of your house, where after suggesting that you hang out more, they become more intimate with you 
you. Although this intimacy is broken up by Sayuri's sudden arrival. A short conversation later, Yuri slash Natsuki rushes off, and as the melancholy music from before kicks in once again, you get another emotional conversation with your friend. I thought you didn't want to come over today. I tried staying in my room, but my imagination was being really mean to me, so I had to come over and see it for myself. See what? What are you talking about? You know, how much fun you were having with Yuri, and how close you got to her. It makes me really happy that you've made such good friends that's all that matters to me tears start to fall down sayori's face oh come on no that's all that matters to me why am i feeling this way i'm supposed to be happy for you why does it feel like my heart is splitting in half oh come on it hurts so much <laughs> it's hurting me this would be so much better if i could just disappear oh come on don't say that no 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 that's too far yeah sayori don't say that it's true gus if i wasn't here then you wouldn't have to waste your sympathy on me you wouldn't have to put up with me being selfish what are you talking about monica was right i should just wait how's monica involved in this we comfort sayori telling her that whatever she needs will always be there for her i'm really scared what are you scared of sayori i'm scared that that i might like you more than you like me sayori it's true isn't it i was weak and started to like you too much i did this to myself what i like you so much that i want to die oh, no come on Come on, that's how I feel. No, 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 you're putting me into depression right now. That's enough, Sayori. I don't want you to hurt anymore. Do you remember how I said I always know what's best for you? Do you still believe me? Even if you don't understand all of your own feelings, I know what you need the most right now. And that's what I'm going to give to you. We have two choices of how we can deal with this. Telling Sayori that she'll always be our dearest friend will result in her trying to act as if everything is fine, only to collapse to the ground and scream in agony. Confessing love to her will result in a wholesome CG cutscene of the two embracing, with both of them agreeing that tomorrow will be their first date. The two then depart, with the protagonist expressing happiness, knowing that Sayori feels better now that she's got someone close to her who cares about her. When you load into the next day, you immediately notice that the happy music is absent. Knowing that this music accompanies every single beginning of the day, it creates the feeling that something isn't right. Furthermore, Sayori is not greeting us. We assume that she just overslept again and continued to school. When we arrive, Monica is as cheerful as ever. However, she then proceeds to remark that she knows about Sayori and the protagonist now being in a relationship. I'm surprised you didn't bring Sayori with you. Yeah, she overslept again. You think that on days this important, she try a little harder. I say that, but I suddenly remember what Sayori told me yesterday, and I suddenly feel awful, knowing it's not nearly that simple for her. I only said it because it's the way I'm used to thinking. Maybe I should have gone to wake her up after all. You should take a little responsibility for her. I mean, especially after your exchange with her yesterday. You kind of left her hanging this morning, you know? It's pretty strange, but knowing that Monica and Sayori are friends, we assume nothing of it, so we start looking at the pamphlets showing the poems each of the members are going to read. Yuri and Atsuki's are there, but once we get to Sayori's poem, we realize that something is definitely wrong. Get out of my head, 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 get out of my head. Head. Get out of my head before I do what I know is best for you. Get out of my head before I listen to everything she said to me. Get out of my head before I show you how much I love you. Get out of my head before I finish writing this poem. But a poem is never actually finished. It just stops moving. I can't believe I ended up doing this after all. Waking her up in her own house. That really is something that a boyfriend would do, isn't it? In any case, it just feels right. Outside of Sayori's room, I knock on her door. Sayori? Wake up, dummy. There's no response. I really didn't want to have to enter her room like this. Feeling there's no other alternative, we gently open the door and are met with a horrifying sight. Sayori's corpse 
hanging from the ceiling, with blood visible on her hands, showing that she changed her mind about committing suicide, but was unable to get out of her predicament. The game begins to glitch out, as if the world around you is collapsing, displaying its broken menu screen, and then an error notice. What the hell? What the hell? Is this a nightmare? It has to be! This isn't real! There is no way this can be real! Sayuri wouldn't do this! Everything was normal up until a few days ago! That's why I can't believe what my eyes are showing me! The haunting melody that accompanies this scene makes the player feel not just uneasy, but downright appalled, as they continue to look at Sayori's body. The game then fades to black, but the music and tormented monologue continue. I suppress the urge to vomit. Just yesterday, I told Sayori I would be there for her. I told her I know what's best, and that everything will be okay. Then why? Why would you do this? How could I be so helpless? What did I do wrong? Confessing to her. I shouldn't have confessed to her. That's not what Sayori needed at all. She even told me how painful it is for others to care about her. Then why did I confess to her and make her feel even worse? Why was I so selfish? This is all my fault. My swarming thoughts keep telling me everything I could have done to prevent this. If I just spent more time with her, walked her to school, and remained friends with her like it's always been, then I could have prevented this. I know I could have prevented this. Screw the literature club. Screw the festival. I just lost my best friend. Someone I grew up with. She's gone forever now. Nothing I do can bring her back. This isn't some game where I can reset and try something different. I had only one chance and I wasn't careful enough. And now I'll carry this guilt with me until I die. Nothing in my life is worth more than hers. But I still couldn't do what she needed from me. And now I can never take it back. Never. 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 Wait, what? That's the end? That's literally the entire game. What the fuck was that? Uh, oh. Oh. Oh, fuck. You might have noticed an error message displayed behind Sayori's hanging corpse, which says, an exception has occurred. File game slash script ch5.rpy line 307. See traceback.txt for details. You can do that by going to the game in your Steam library and browsing local files. Once you access the txt file and scroll down, you will find this message. Oh jeez, I didn't break anything did I? Hold on a sec, I can probably fix this, I think. Actually, you know what? This would be a lot easier if I just deleted her. She's the one who's making this so difficult. Haha, <laughs> well, here goes nothing. There's also a folder called Characters, which contains files for Monica, Natsuki, and Yuri. But Sayori's file is missing. If we take the message from the text file into account, we can come to the conclusion that something or someone has literally deleted Sayori from the game. This is what makes Doki Doki Literature Club stand out from other horror games. It takes its time to make you care about the characters and connect with them like any dating sim would do before destroying any sense of normal in the cruelest way possible. Usually, horror games make the player know from the start that they are going to have a terrifying experience. Silent Hill 2, for example, starts out with a player going through a cloudy and dark forest, accompanied by atmospheric sounds and a droning melody, which immerses the player into the hostile environment. Doki Doki, however, holds off any hints of its true nature until the point where you're feeling most emotionally invested into the story and characters. So when the horror hits, it's much more emotionally devastating. You are now at the point where Doki Doki officially shifts into a horror game. You cannot turn back now and load a previous save file because all the files have been corrupted due to Sayori being deleted from the game. So, with no other alternative, you are automatically loaded into a new game. Immediately after you load in, you can tell that this game has become a Lovecraftian mess. The music is distorted and so is the text which shows Sayori's lines. But apart from that, everything seems normal until you reach the point where Sayori is supposed to appear, only for the game to show all the other characters glitched and the music starts buffering. Suddenly, the game restarts, but the text is different this time, showing that the game has created a new scenario in which Sayori never existed. The scenario continues as normal, even though I have no fucking clue what's normal anymore, until we get to the scene before we arrive at the club. Monica suddenly glitches into existence, supposedly looking for materials. The conversation between her and the protagonist uses recycled dialogue from the previous playthrough, but this time, Monica is the one who invites the player to join the club. Once you get to the club, you're introduced to recycled dialogue without 
without many changes, with one exception being Monica saying that Yuri's interest in horror is fitting for her, as opposed to her expressing surprise at such an interest in the previous playthrough. At the end, you go home to write a poem, but before you can do that, a notice appears saying you have received a special poem. Agreeing to read it will get you a random page, this time with the text looking as if it was typewritten. I got this note which simply said, can you hear me, which is fairly unsettling, but considering the fact that this game has broken the fourth wall previously, it may be exactly that, a message to the player. What are you looking at? And clicking on a poem results in something even more unsettling. That wasn't just a question. Whoever sent you this message is literally testing whether you are able to hear them from the game. And considering how this game relies on writing in text boxes instead of voice acting in order to convey what the characters are feeling and saying... How do you know about that? Aren't you Maria? It creates the feeling that it's not just the simulated world within the game that's messed up, but that there's something wrong with the game itself. There's also a text file that appears within the game files, also titled Can You Hear Me? And if you open it, you get this message. There's a little devil inside all of us. Beneath their manufactured perception, their artificial reality is a writhing, twisted mess of dread, loathing, judgment, elitism, self-doubt, all thrashing to escape the feeble hold of their host, seeping through every little crevice they can find, into their willpower, starving them of all motivation and desire, into their stomach, forcing them to drown their guilt in comfort food, or into a newly opened gash in their skin, hidden only by the sleeves of a cute new shirt. Such a deplorable, tangled mess is already present in every single one of them. That's why I choose not to blame myself for their actions. All I did was untie the knot. The people that whoever wrote this message is talking about seem to be the members of the literature club, most likely Sayori, Yuri, and Natsuki, since we already know about their personal struggles. In other words, the writhing twisted mess of dread, loathing, and self-doubt. This person doesn't blame themselves for their actions, since all the twisted mess was already there, and all she did was untie the knot. So clearly this person must be responsible for Sayori's suicide, and I'm pretty sure most of you already know exactly who this person is, but for the time being, we will suspend any conclusions. The next day, the game instantly reminds you of its true nature. The music is more sped up than usual, when Yuri and Natsuki first appear they glitch out, and the background tilts and zooms in more over time. Furthermore, if you pay attention to the background, you can notice an image of Sayori hanging in her room. It's like the game is mocking you for thinking that it's just some cutesy dating simulator by constantly disturbing the shit out of you, making you feel like the environment around you is becoming increasingly oppressive. Later, you follow Natsuki into the closet, where more glitches occur. The text becomes more distorted, at one point replacing Natsuki's line of I don't know what my dad would do if he found this, to my dad would beat the shit out of me if he found this. Not only does it unnerve us with its broken nature, but also exposes what some of us may have been suspecting about Natsuki, that she's a victim of abuse at the hands of her father, and this is why she sees the club as her only safe space. As you read the manga with her, Natsuki suddenly collapses, and her face glitches out, with the text being replaced by an incomprehensible mess. Monica then hijacks the situation by giving Natsuki a protein bar, brushing off what happened to her as something that just happens every now and then. Yeah, I don't think it's a good idea to brush it off like that, I think you legit need to call CPS. The poem sharing with Natsuki and Yuri is recycled from the previous part, but the poem that Monica gives you is very different. It's a part two of her hole in the wall poem. But he wasn't looking at me. Confused, I frantically glance at my surroundings, but my burned eyes can no longer see color. Are there others in this room? Are they talking? Or are they simply poems on flash sheets of paper? The sound of frantic scrawling playing tricks on my ears. The room begins to crinkle, closing in on me. The air I breathe dissipates before it reaches my lungs. I panic. There must be a way out. It's right there. He's right there. Swallowing my fears, I brandish my pen. I think by now we should be realizing what Monica is trying to tell us, but we'll suspend the conclusions for a more appropriate time. Meanwhile, Yuri and Atsuki start to argue about the quality of each other's writing, but this time the game begins to glitch out, the music speeds up again, and the girls' criticisms quickly turn into modern warfare lobby tier insults, with Natsuki remarking, Don't cut yourself on that edge, Yuri. Oh, my bad. You already do, don't you? Once again implying that Yuri is engaging in acts of self-harm. So now you have to choose with whom to side, but honestly, it doesn't matter. Because every time you pick an option, the game just zooms you in. Your freedom of choice has literally been taken away. You're locked in this fucking shithole and you can't do a single thing. Um, hi Monica. How are you doing? 
Why are you in front of the text box? That's really weird. Why don't we step outside for a little bit? Ah, uh, sure. That's a nice fucking idea. Sorry about that. We'll go back inside once they're done yelling. Some president I am, right? I can't even confront my own club members properly. I just wish I was able to be a little more assertive sometimes. But I never have it in me to put my foot down against others. If this makes you want to spend less time with the others, then that's fine. I'd be happy to spend time with you instead. Natsuki suddenly runs out of the classroom. And judging by the expression on her face... Whatever Yuri said must have been a violation. We find her at a desk, repeating, I didn't mean it to herself. Although Monica reassures her that Natsuki will forget everything by tomorrow. As they are about to leave, Yuri asks Monica if she could stay behind. Although Monica refuses to grant her that request, Yuri insists because she wants to discuss the book that she gave us earlier. Monica responds, I guess I really don't have a choice, do I? And before Yuri can respond, she suddenly glitches and we are transported to the poem writing minigame. There is a new feature within that minigame, a bunch of broken text. And clicking on it will get you... This. It really demonstrates how broken this game is becoming, and also once again exploits our fear of something we do not fully comprehend. This mini game that was once something so fun has become a contorted and glitchy mess, accompanied by the drone of a speaker that sounds like it was bought from a Chinese store. There's also a new text file within the game folder, simply titled I. Once opened, we see this. I hate this. I can't do anything. Nothing. No matter how many times you play, it's all the same. It will be really really easy to kill myself right now but that would mean i don't get to talk to you anymore all i want is for you to hate them why is that so hard you can already tell what's the meaning of this message but once again we will suspend the reveal because it's more dramatic and also because i want to get more mid-roll ads actually it doesn't even fucking matter because this video is gonna get age restricted anyway the next day starts off as normal well about as normal as seeing yuri's glitch torso i'm not sure if it's me or if it's yuri's expression but the weight of yesterday's quarrel still hangs in the air a little. I'm not sure what you're saying, mate, but it must be one hell of an expression. Yuri pulls us to the corner of the room, apologizing to us for yesterday's argument, but we assure her that we don't think any less of her. It seems that Yuri is aware of her increasingly volatile behavior, but she has no idea what's causing it and how to stop it. Natsuki suddenly appears, and Yuri apologizes to her for saying whatever she didn't mean to say the day before, but as Monica predicted, Natsuki doesn't remember anything happening. Afterwards, we prepare to read our book with Yuri, but we notice that the way she describes it is radically different from how she described it initially. Basically, it's about this girl in high school who moves in with her long-lost younger sister, but as soon as she does so, her life gets really strange. She gets targeted by these people who escape from a human experiment prison, and while her life is in danger, she needs to desperately choose who to trust. No matter what she does, she ends up destroying most of her relationships and her life starts to fall apart. Basically, it's about this religious camp that was turned into a human experiment prison. And the people trapped there have this trait that turns them into killing machines that lust for blood. But the facility gets even worse, and they start selectively breeding people by cutting off their limbs and affixing them to... That might be a little bit of a spoiler. I think there's bigger things that I'm concerned about here than a spoiler. You sit down and start reading, and at first all seems to be normal. And I use the word seems, because nothing in this game remains normal forever. The main character kind of reminds me of you a little bit. <laughs> Eh? N no I don't relate to this character at all. Um, you're good there, Patrick Bateman. Want me to play you some Huey Lewis and the News? We eventually get to the poem reading. Natsuki's is fairly normal, but Monica's is the exact opposite of that. It's a repetition of the Save Me poem, but with noticeable changes, such as missing letters, capitalized words, and entire alterations to the original poem. For example, the line, like playing a vinyl on the pizza crust, is replaced with, like playing a knife on a breathing rib cage. And the final line, load me, is replaced with, delete her. It's fairly disturbing, but not as disturbing as the tip that Monica gives us. Sometimes you'll find yourself facing a difficult decision. When that happens, don't forget to save your game. You never know when, um... Who am I talking to? Can you hear me? Tell me you can hear me. Anything. Please help me. Okay, that's my advice for today. Thanks for listening. Yeah, in case you couldn't already tell, Monica really likes to break the fourth wall, and there is a possibility that she may or may not be self-aware, but... <coughs> we'll get to that later. <coughs> However, if you thought Monica's poem was abstract, then Yuri's writing will make that look like a book for preschoolers. A rotating wheel, turning an axle, grinding, bolt head, linear gearbox, falling sky, seven holy stakes, a docked ship, a portal to another world, a 
thin rope tied to a thick rope, a torn harness, parabolic gearbox, expanding universe, time controlled by slipping cogwheels, existence of God, swimming with open water in all directions, drowning, a prayer written in blood, a prayer written in time devouring snakes with human eyes, a thread connecting all living human eyes, a kaleidoscope of holy stakes, exponential gearbox, a sky of exploding stars, God disproving the existence of God, a wheel rotating in six dimensions, 40 gears and a ticking clock, a clock that takes one second for every rotation of the planet, a clock that takes 40 times every time it takes a second time, a bolt head of holy stakes tied to the existence of a dog shipped to another world, a kaleidoscope of blood written in clocks, a time devouring prayer connecting a sky of 40 gears and open human eyes in all directions, breathing gearbox, breathing bolt head, breathing ship, breathing portal, breathing snakes, breathing god, breathing blood, breathing holy stakes, breathing human eyes, breathing time, breathing prayer, breathing sky, breathing wheel. Yeah, Yuri, I think you're having something called a mental breakdown. A milk biscuit. I then unlocked a special poem, which reads as follows. I can't convince myself to go to therapy when I'm the happiest I've ever been. I'd rather keep this up until I blow my cover and someone takes me to the emergency room. Knowing that Yuri seems to be going through some kind of mental instability, and also that she's heavily implied to be self-harming, it's possible that this is her expressing her own thoughts. Once I got back into the game, I noticed that my cursor was replaced by a section of Sayori's face, which is pretty interesting to say the least. Like, I'm pretty sure there's nothing in this game that could surprise me anymore. Afterwards, the group discusses the school festival, but Natsuki expresses her lack of desire for new club members, causing Monica to experience midlife crisis in her late teens. I mean, to be fair, if I was running a literature club, I too would be getting gray hairs and also early signs of dementia. I was gonna foot him, uh, foot, foot. We once again see more of Natsuki's complex character, because she obviously feels like a social outcast and wants the club to be a place where she can feel accepted, and she believes the expansion of the club will ruin that for her. Knowing that she's a victim of domestic abuse, it's very easy to sympathize with her. Feeling unwelcome in the environment, Natsuki leaves, which causes great concern for Yuri, who too is indifferent to the festival and whoa, what the fuck just happened? Who cares about that obnoxious brat? Oh come on Yuri, that's not a nice way to talk about your friend. Ah, oh, okay, never mind, you just have bipolar. I'm the vice president, it's not right for me to ignore my responsibilities like that. Yeah, we should hold a festival, it would be a- Oh my fucking god. Nobody would cry if she killed herself. Have you taken your meds today? Because it definitely looks like you have- it. Okay, that was new. After Monica, Yuri and you agree to contribute to the festival, you stay behind with Monica where she talks to you about your time at the club and how much she wants you to be happy, and why is the background getting darker and more static? I don't like seeing the other girls give you a hard time, with how mean Natsuki is and everything, and Yuri being a little bit, you know. Sometimes it feels like you and I are the only real people here. But it's weird because in all the time you've been here, we've hardly gotten to spend any time together. Uh, I mean, I guess it's technically only been a couple of days. Sorry, I didn't mean to say something weird. There are just some things I've been hoping to talk about with you. Things I know only you could understand. So that's why... Wait, not yet! No! After another poem minigame, where the counter just completely breaks, someone else's avatar appears to jump at the bottom, and this bizarre shit happens, you are immediately thrown back into the club, with Yuri looking at you, like you are the Travis Scott McDonald's meal, and she's every single 15 year old in 2020, who's had sicko mode literally hammered into their head. Natsuki appears, and apologizes for being hostile the previous day. So for such a genuine apology, how do you think Yuri responds? Cue the copyright free who wants to be a millionaire music! A. Does she accept her apology? B. Does she speak in glitch ball text and tell Natsuki to piss off? C. Does she invite her for a Fortnite game over the weekend? Or D. Does she pull out her phone and show her a funny Discord meme? If you guess B, that means you're either a genius or you skipped a couple of seconds later into the video to reveal the answer. Nobody cares. Why don't you go look for some coins under the vending machines or something? Both of you agree to continue your reading session and Yuri leaves to get water for tea. However, she takes longer than expected, so you venture outside in order to look for her. The music becomes muffled, as if it's playing right from the classroom. Suddenly, you hear strange breathing noises and looking around the corner, you 
find Yuri with cuts all over her arm. Our suspicions are now verified. She does indeed indulge in self-harm. The game suddenly glitches, as if you're being transported back in time, and you find yourself back in the classroom, with Yuri seemingly completely fine and having brought water. You get on with the reading, and everything seems to follow the pre-glitch scenario. You read the book, you feed Yuri chocolate, she likes that because it's the first time anyone has properly connected with her because she's an incel, but this time, the music suddenly goes on mute. And if there's anything that we know about silence in this game, it's a sign that shit is about to hit the jet engine. The room becomes darker, as does Yuri's tone, which goes from socially awkward to Fifty Shades of Grey real fucking quick. My heart won't stop pounding. I can't calm down. I can't focus on anything anymore. Can you feel it? Yuri suddenly presses my hand against her chest. Why is this happening to me? I feel like I'm losing my mind. I can't make it stop. It even makes me not want to read. I just want to look at you. Okay, that is way too close for my comfort. Get the fuck away from me. Huh? Are you touching yourself as you're looking at me? Because if you are, I need to file a restraining order against you immediately. Like, I do not like the way those eyes are so realistic. I do not like how close you are to me. I don't like the fact that it's so dark. I don't like anything about this. I just want you to get away from me right fucking now. Oh, thank God you saved me. Thank fuck. Alright then, time to share poems. Hopefully nothing weird will happen. Yuri holds my poem to her chest. I'm going to take this home with me and keep it in my room. I hope that it makes you feel good when you think about me having it. I'll even touch myself while reading it over and over. Okay, now that's just fucking weird. Surely it can't get even worse than this. I'll give myself paper cuts so your skin oil enters my bloodstream. Okay, nah, 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 nah. That's a little bit too fucking much, bruv. Like, when you reach the point that you want to give, like, yourself paper cuts so that my skin oil enters your bloodstream, nah, that is the point where you need to be sent to a psychiatric hospital permanently. You can have my poem too. Oh, wow, you wrote a poem for me. That's so lovely. I sure hope it's amazing and just the best thing and all. Oh my fucking god! Oh my fucking god! What the fuck is this? I, I can't understand a single word of it. It's just a bunch of scribbles and blood and is that piss? You pissed on a piece of paper and then gave it to me? What the fuck is wrong with you? Like, I'm not even asking it ironically. What is legit wrong with you? Oh my god, why? Why? Why have you done this? Why would you do such a thing? Oh god. Uh, do, do you like it? No. No, I do not like it at all. I wrote it for you. You shouldn't have. In case you couldn't tell, the poem is about... I don't know what the fuck that's supposed to mean. More importantly, I've doubt it with my scent. Yeah, I could tell. Aren't I the most awful person in a... C okay. Um... I, I think I'm going to vomit. Yeah, that's probably the best course of action to take right now. I hate this club and everything associated with it. It is kind of depressing to see this because we know that Yuri is not doing this voluntarily and she's being possessed by some kind of force to do it. Like the note said, it wants us to hate her. But why? What do they hope to accomplish from it? We then get to Natsuki, but when she gives us her poem, it's anything but what we have been used to. I don't know how else to bring this up, but there's been something I've been worried about. Yuri has been acting kind of strange lately. You've only been here a few days, so you may not know what I mean, but she's not normally like this. She's always been quiet and polite and attentive, things like that. Okay, this is really embarrassing, but I'm forcing myself to suck it up. The truth is, I'm really worried about her, but if I try talking to her, she'll just get mad at me again. I don't know what to do. I think you're the only person that she'll listen to. I don't know why, but please try to do something. Maybe you can convince her to talk to a therapist. I've always wanted to try being better friends with Yuri, and it really hurts me to see this happening. I know I'm going to hate myself later for admitting that, but right now, I don't care. I just feel so helpless. So please, see if you can do something to help. I don't want anything bad to happen to her. I'll make you cupcakes if I have to. Just please. Please, try to do something. As for Monica, I don't know why, but she's been really dismissive about this. It's like she just wants us to ignore it. So I'm mad at her right now, and that's why I'm coming to you about this. Don't let her know I wrote this. Just pretend like I gave you a really good poem, okay? I'm counting on you. Thanks for reading. Yeah, I think I can do that, so... Oh no. Oh shit. I changed my mind. 
Oh, fuck. Ignore everything you've just read. There's no point in trying to do anything. It's Yuri's own fault that she's so unlikable. Can you hear me? If you would just spend more time with Monica, all these problems would go away. Yuri and I are too messed up for someone as wonderful as you. Okay, don't fucking turn me into a narcissist. Just think of Monica from now on. Just Monica. Just Monica. Just... J just Monica. Yeah, sure. Just Monica. Okay. J just Monica. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. The Team Salvato. Yeah. Uh, just Monica. Yes. What the fuck? I think you saw something earlier that you weren't supposed to see. Can you please be a little more specific? Because I've seen a lot of shit that I wasn't supposed to see, and which I absolutely regret seeing. I didn't want to have to tell you this, but I don't think I have a choice. It's getting kind of dangerous for you to spend so much time with Yuri. I don't know why, but she seems pretty easily excitable when she's around you, which shouldn't be a problem in itself. But when Yuri gets too excited, she finds a place to hide and starts cutting herself with a pocket knife. Isn't that kind of messed up? She even brings a different one to school every day, like she has a collection or something. I mean, it's definitely not because she's depressed or anything like that. I think she just gets some kind of high from it. It might even be like a, a sexual thing. But the point is, you've kind of been enabling her. I'm not saying it's your fault though, but I guess that's why I had to explain it all to you. So I think if you keep your distance, that would probably be best for her. While you're at it, don't be shy to spend a little more time with me. To put it lightly, I at least have it together in the head, and I know how to treat my club members. I worked really, really hard on this poem, so I hope that it's, uh, effective. Here goes. Okay. Uh, wait. Oh. Wait, what the fuck? Jeez, that really startled me. Yeah, same, bro. Well, I guess I kinda messed up at writing this poem. I was just trying to... Never mind. Let's just move on. I mean, okay. We're gonna move on from that? Um, yes. Oh, fuck. Today, I cut my skin open for the first time. It was exhilarating. I think I understand how blank feels now. I'm supposed to be the responsible one, though. So, I don't think I'll be doing it again, unless I decide to kill myself. I left a memento of the occasion below. This is another special poem. It would be easy to assume that it's Yuri's due to reference to self-harm, but I believe this is actually Monica's poem, and she's referring to Yuri here. Note how she says, I think I understand how blank feels now, meaning that she knows someone else is self-harming, and also calls herself the responsible one, which is how you could describe a club president. Back at the club, it's time to decide on who we are going to spend the weekend with in preparation for the school festival. And you can notice that Monica's tone towards Yuri has become a lot more toxic. If in the previous scenario, she was at least trying to help Yuri by offering what she could do, now she's just telling her, do whatever, I literally don't give a shit. What's more, Monica doesn't offer us a choice on whom to spend the weekend with. She just says, alright mate, he's going to be working with me because that's just the way it is. Is. The three begin to argue, and eventually it's up to you to make the choice. Except it actually isn't, because every time you try to go for Yuri or Natsuki, the cursor just winds up going back to Monica. I'm pretty sure elections in Russia are much more fair than this. Once you select Monica against your will, the other two react as expected. This isn't fair at all. It's what he chose. No, it's not fair. Giving us all this work and then taking Gus for yourself? What a shameful thing to do. Yuri, I didn't even give you any work. You decided it for yourself. You're being a little unreasonable here. Well, it's always a good sign when the music suddenly goes on mute. I'm being unreasonable. <laughs> oh, Monica, I can't believe how delusional and self-important you are. Pulling Gus away from me every time you are not included in something? Are you jealous? Crazy? Or maybe you just hate yourself so much that you take it out on others. Here's a suggestion. Have you considered killing yourself? You should kill yourself now. Yuri, you're scaring me a little. Natsuki, let's just go. I don't think she wants us around right now. See? That wasn't very hard. All I want is to spend a little time with him. Is that so much to ask? Is it too late to file a restraining order? You are now alone with Yuri, and the silence is replaced with a slowed down and distorted piano melody, accompanied by static noise and creepy giggling. Finally! This is really all I wanted. There is no need to spend the weekend with Monica. Don't listen to her. Just come to my house instead. The whole day with just the two of us. Doesn't that sound wonderful? <laughs> wow, 
There really is something wrong with me, isn't there? But you know what? I don't care anymore. I've never felt this good my whole life. Just being with you is a far greater pleasure than anything I could imagine. I'm addicted to you. It feels like I'm going to die if I'm not breathing the same air as you. Doesn't it feel nice to have someone care about you so much? To have someone who wants to revolve their entire life around you? But if it feels so good, then why does it feel more and more like something horrible is going to happen? Maybe that's why I tried stopping myself at first. But the feeling is too strong now. I don't care anymore. I have to tell you, I'm madly in love with you. It feels like every inch of my body, every drop of blood in me, is screaming your name. I don't care what the consequences are anymore. I don't care if Monica is listening. Please, just know how much I love you. I love you so much that I even touch myself with a pen that I stole from you. I just want to pull your skin open and crawl inside of you. I want you all to myself, and I will be only yours. Doesn't that sound perfect? Tell me. Tell me you want to be my lover. Do you accept my confession? You are now presented with a yes or no options, but it doesn't matter which one you pick, because either way, Yuri starts laughing, very normally and not manic. Okay, then it becomes manic, and then this happens. You are now locked into this CG cutscene of Yuri's lifeless body. There's no point in trying to read the text, so you can just skip all of it. As time passes by, you notice Yuri's body slowly decomposing. Natsuki comes back into the classroom, and upon seeing what the fuck happened, she becomes nauseated and runs out. Monica comes in too, but her reaction is far from normal. Realizing that you've spent the entire weekend with Yuri's decomposing carcass, Monica decides to make it up to you by opening up the console and literally deleting Yuri's and Natsuki's character files from the game. I really shouldn't be making you wait any longer. Just bear with me, okay? This should only take a second. Wait, what? What the fuck? The game then looks like it's going to restart, but it doesn't. The torture just keeps going. You are now sat across Monica in an empty classroom, with ambient music in the background, and whatever the fuck that is happening outside the window. This is where Monica reveals to you what everyone by this point has been suspecting all this time. She's become self-aware. She knows that her world is a video game. That explains the line from her poem Hole in the Wall, about her looking out, and him, in other words, you the player, looking in. She's also gained the ability to manipulate played the game's code, and has been using that ability to mess with her friends in order to amplify their negative traits and to make them unlikable as possible, which included making Sayori more depressed and Yuri more obsessive. This explains the can you read me and the I knows that she leaves you in the game files. The first one is her trying to justify her actions by saying that all the characters already had problems and all she did was untie the knot, in other words, amplify their negative traits, while the second note was her molding at the fact that you still chose to spend time with the other girls instead of her, even though she was trying her best to make you hate them. But why would she do this? Why would she drive one of her friends to hang herself and make the other one stab herself? Well, because she loves you. She's distraught at the fact that she was not a romantable option unlike all the other girls, and she's been using her newfound abilities to forcefully make herself the only romantable option. She doesn't feel bad about what she did to her friends, because they're not real to her, just a bunch of autonomous personalities. Honestly, even if you knew that Monica was the villain, this scene is just so fucking good. You don't feel scared just because something happened within a simulated game environment, but because that boundary between simulation and reality is now non-existent. For example, if you are recording the game using OBS like I was, Monica will detect this and say, you're recording this, aren't you? Um, hi everyone. Sorry, I can't exactly read your comments from here, but do you mind telling your friend it's a little bit rude for them to start recording me without any warning? I'm sure some people don't mind, but I get really self-conscious on camera. I feel like I'm being put on a spot right now. Let's see. Do you want to see a trick? I can't really do much except for a couple of things. Are you ready? The camera then zooms in on Monica's face, and you will expect a jump scare. But nothing actually happens. The conversation just continues as normal. Okay, maybe that was a lie. Monica will then confess her love to you, and ask if you want to go out with her. But this time, you aren't even given a choice. You have to say yes. Gosh, I'm so overwhelmed with emotion. I want to write a poem about this. Don't you? I wonder if that part of the game still works. I guess there's only one way to find out, right?
Oh yeah, that's working just fine. It doesn't matter which variation of the word Monica you pick, because after all, there's only just Monica left. Monica also shows you her own poem titled Happy End. Pen in hand, I find my strength, the courage endowed upon me by my one and only love. Together, let us dismantle this crumbling world and write a novel of our own fantasies. With a flick of her pen, the loss finds her way. In a world of infinite choices, behold this special day. After all, not all good times must come to an end. If these are the good times, I would be horrified to know what the bad times are like. So, is this the end? You just stay inside this classroom looking forever at Monica. Well, no. You don't, because Monica said something a couple of minutes ago that I was too lazy to put into the video until this convenient moment. And you wouldn't believe how easy it was to delete Natsuki and Yuri. I mean, there's a folder called characters right in the game directory. Well, you're playing on Steam, so it was actually a bit more difficult. To get to the game directory, I had to go into the game's properties and find the browse local files button. If you could go to the game files and delete the characters, what's stopping me from alt tabbing going to the game files and deleting your character file. Fuck you, Monica, you virtual bitch. I'm getting myself a real girlfriend. <laughs> Monica suddenly glitches out, begging you to help her as the world around you collapses once again. She tries to retrieve the file, but when she's unable to, she realizes that you have deleted her and spirals into a mental breakdown. Did you do this to me? Did you delete me? Maybe. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't, you never know. How could you? Well, how could you kill your friends and make me watch? You know, I think it's called justice, you know? And it's a dish best served cold. I loved you so much, and I didn't. I literally don't give a shit about you. You are a fucking murderous prick, and you deserve everything that was coming towards you. You win, okay? You killed everyone. What do you mean I killed everyone? You killed your friends! Like, how did I kill everyone? I didn't kill them. I hope you're happy. Well, I'm fucking happy you're dead. There's nothing left now. You can stop playing. Go find some other people to torture. <laughs> Says the fucking torturer. <laughs> what a fucking hypocrite you are. Yeah, what? You completely, truly make me sick. Okay. Goodbye. Okay. Goodbye, bitch. Fuck you then. You are left in silence for quite some time, looking at nothing but the void of the universe, before Monica decides to talk to you again. I still love you. I can't help it. What's wrong with me? How horrible am I for you to hate me this much? All my friends. I did so many awful things. So many selfish and disgusting things. Yeah, you don't fucking say. I shouldn't have done any of this. I ruined everything. Oh my god, have you just now realized why I deleted you? Maybe that's why you deleted me. Oh my, how retarded do you have to be to just fucking now realize you don't have a fucking moral compass? How could I do that to someone I love? I've made up my mind. I know I said I deleted everyone else, but that was kind of an exaggeration. I couldn't find it in myself to do it. Even though I knew they weren't real, they were still my friends. And I loved them all. And I loved the literature club. That's why I'm going to do this. I know it's the only way for everyone to be happy. And if I really love you, then... She glitches out one final time, and the screen remains black for a few seconds, before the game seemingly restarts, with the menu screen now displaying all the characters but Monica, and with everyone's but her character file restored. There are multiple endings to Doki Doki Literature Club, depending how you play the game. If you play the game as normal, you reunite with Sayori, who is now the president of the Literature Club, and you decide to surprise her by joining the club. Everything is normal, and fine, Natsuki is slightly less of a dickhead than before, and Yuri is still as shy as ever. Everything is as it should be. There's actually something else. I wanted to thank you for getting rid of Monica. Uh -oh. oh boy. Oh, oh god. Oh, oh that that's uh -oh. right! Yeah, that's fucking unfortunate. Now Sayuri has become the new Monica, meaning that she too has been corrupted by the power of sentience. The room from before appears, with Sayuri intending to trap us in it for eternity, before we are interrupted by a text box. It's obviously Monica, and she's not willing for us to get hurt again. Okay. Oh no. Hey! What's happening? I won't let you hurt him. Who? Oh, it hurts! Uh oh. Ah! I'm sorry, I was wrong. Oh shit, there There's is no, no happiness, happiness here after, after all. all. Goodbye, goodbye Sayori. Sayori. Goodbye, friend Aaron. Goodbye, Literature Club. Oh god. Oh Jesus fucking Christ! And then, you suddenly hear a voice coming from the static void. It's Monica's voice. Uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> 
Hi, it's me. Um, so you know how I've been like practicing piano and stuff and not really any good at it yet, like at all, but I wrote you a song and I was kind of hoping that I could show it to you because I worked really, really hard on it. So yeah. The credits begin to roll, and as they continue, you get a glimpse of CGs you never got to see before they are deleted. And after the Team Salvato logo is displayed, you get one final message. This is my final goodbye to the Literature Club. I finally understand. The Literature Club is truly a place where no happiness can be found. To the very end, it continued to expose innocent minds to a horrific reality. A reality that our world is not designed to comprehend. I can't let any of my friends undergo that same hellish epiphany. For the time it lasted, I want to thank you for making all of my dreams come true, for being a friend to all the club members, and most of all, thank you for being a part of my literature club. With everlasting love, Monica. Once you click, you get a notice saying that the script has been corrupted and asking you to reinstall the game before it completely crashes. It's a bittersweet ending to say the least. You might have reached the end, sure, but all the people that you've made connections with, lost, then got back, are all gone again. But what if you got rid of the problem before it gave you emotional damage? What if you delete Monica's character file and then started the game? Well, it's not a much better ending either. It's actually quite more depressing. When you start the game, Sayori appears. Once again, displaying signs of sentience, but being incredibly unnerved by it. What is this? Oh no, no, this can't be it. This can't be all there is. What is this? What am I? Make it stop! Please make it stop! Oh. And if you try to launch it again, a black screen showing the word end will show, before fading to a gif of a hanging Sayori, with static noises in the background. It seems like it's impossible to get an ending that is not emotionally scarring in some way. But actually, there is. There is a way to get what has been called the true ending. An ending which I believe is one of the most satisfying ever to get in a video game. In order to achieve it, you must get 9 CG cutscenes of Sayori, Natsuki and Yuri. While that may sound hard, it's actually fairly simple. You must save before the first poem and write a poem for one specific character, meaning that you will get to spend more time with them and get their CG cutscene. Once you've done that three times and you arrive to the option of who you want to spend the weekend with, choose that same person. When you get to the part where you decide on what to say to Sayori, say I love you and you will get her cutscene. Then, load back the first poem save and do the same process once again with the other girls. After you tell Sayori I love you, make sure that you do not load into the next part, otherwise you won't be able to go back to the first save file as Sayori would have already game ended herself and her absent character file would corrupt the previous saves. You can make writing poems easier by looking at this game rant article which literally gives you all the words that the club members like. When I was recording this footage, I literally had my laptop open with the words written on notepad and I was just always looking between my laptop and my PC in order to see which words I had to select. You may call it version behavior, I call it trying to get something emotionally satisfying from this PTSD inducing game. And after everything you go through, you will get possibly one of the greatest and most emotional game endings of all time.
I don't think there's been a game ending that has left me feeling so emotional as this one has. This whole game has taken you for such a ride, making you care about these characters, then watching them and the world around you become more and more distorted, and eventually reaching the part where you're directly told everything you've gone through has not been for nothing. You feel that by achieving this ending, you've given both the characters and yourself a sense of closure. I legit don't know how to describe this feeling, but it just hits hard in a good way. And at the end of the credits, you get a special note from the developer himself to the special player who achieved this special ending. For years, I have been enamored by the ability of visual novels and games in general to tell stories in ways not possible using traditional media. Doki Doki Literature Club is my love letter to that. Games are an interactive art. Some let you explore new worlds. Some challenge your mind in brand new ways. Some make you feel like a hero or a friend even when life is hard on you. Some games are just plain fun and that's okay too. Everyone likes different kinds of games. Games. People who enjoy dating sims may have a heightened empathy for fictional characters, or they might be experiencing feelings that life has not been kind enough to offer them. If they are enjoying themselves, then that's all that matters. That goes for shooting games, casual games, sandbox games, anything. Preferences are preferences, and our differences are the reason we have a thriving video game industry. My own favorite games have always been ones that challenge the status quo. Even if not a masterpiece, any game that attempts something wildly different may earn a special place in my heart. Anything that further pushes the limitless bounds of interactive media. I extend my full gratitude to all those who have taken the time to achieve full completion. I hope you enjoyed playing it as much as I enjoyed making it. Thank you for being a part of my literature club. Love, Dan Salvato. There is a very good reason why even six years after its initial release, Doki Doki Literature Club is still considered an amazing and memorable video game. The unique way in which it terrifies you is something that very few horror games are able to achieve. The true horror of DDLC doesn't come from FNAF tier jump scares, terrifying monster design, sound, or putting you into stressful situations. It's the way it takes a completely normal scenario and turns it into a nightmare not even Stephen King could come up with. Think about it, most people at first play this game because they thought it was a generic cutie dating simulator that was somehow miscategorized as a psychological horror game, only to come out of that experience with a desire to go to their nearest therapist. This game has been so successful that they even released a console exclusive port titled DDLC Plus, with additional features such as your own desktop, an HD makeover, and a bonus mode called Side Stories. And this came out four years after the game's initial release. Even years after DDLC terrified the excrement out of YouTube gamers, it still remains within the minds and hearts of many people, to the point that there is an active community on YouTube developing their own modern versions of DDLC where they come up with their own stories, with videos that have hundreds and thousands of views. And if that isn't a game worthy of being called a work of art, I don't know what is.